Hello, Pastor Rob Elka here, and we want to welcome you today to our recording for our service for Sunday, February 7th. Just want to remind you today, we will be celebrating communion. And so if you could get some emblems ready for that, that would be awesome. Maybe some crackers or bread and some juice, and just have that ready to go, and we'll celebrate that a little bit later on. We're going to start out by worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with this song with Pat and Rebecca called The Lion and the Lamb. So just wherever you are right now, just lift up praises to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, today. He's coming on the clouds.
Jesus, we do honor you for your amazing love. It is just that. It is amazing. And we are going to honor him as well with communion today. So I invite you to join with me in this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat, this is my body which is for you. We've heard those words many times, but did you know that those words were more commonly used in Jesus' day as part of a wedding ceremony? Say what? The man in this ceremony was saying to the woman, eat this bread. It represents how I pledge my body and my life to you. My solemn promise to you is that I will protect you, defend you, and provide for you. I give my body to you. And so the disciples, having heard these words at weddings many times, were no doubt puzzled when the master used them with no bride, no groom, or no wedding party in sight. They were not puzzled after Jesus left them. Uh, just before he ascended in, uh, in a cloud to heaven, he promised something else with the words, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He is the husband of the church. He's our provider. He's our protector. He's our shield. He is our shelter. And so this bread that we eat is his promise to us, his covenant guarantee. By this bread, he says, I do. And so as we take the bread today, it is also our way of saying in response, I do. Let's take the bread together. Jesus, we thank you that we are in a covenant relationship with you, the bridegroom of the church. We thank you for you giving yourself for us, your life, for our protection, uh, to be our shield, to be our help. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful relationship that we get to participate in. Jesus, we thank you for offering up your body, coming to earth and even taking a body and becoming one of us and then laying that same body down, Lord, for the church that we might live. We give praise and thanks to you today. Of course, it goes on to say, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Four cups were typically consumed at the Passover. It was a custom that goes all the way back to Exodus in our Bibles. And the first was the cup of sanctification. Uh, it means, I will bring you out. The second cup was the cup of deliverance. I will free you. 
After eating, Jesus and his friends drink a third cup, and that is the cup of redemption, which means I will bless you. And so this is the cup that we observe today when taking communion. The one with Jesus sets up a, a new covenant. And so what Jesus did for us on the cross provided the blessing of salvation. Now, the fourth cup is the cup of restoration, means I will protect you. And so Jesus does not drink from this cup, but he tells his followers that he will not drink from it until he drinks it new with us in his Father's kingdom. And we eagerly await that day. And there's also a fifth cup, and that's the cup of wrath. Jesus is the only one who can drink from this cup. When he was on the cross and said, I am thirsty, he was saying, give me the fifth cup that I might drink all of it. And he drank it so that we wouldn't have to. So let's participate in the cup of redemption today. Let's drink it together. Jesus, we thank you that we can share in the cup of redemption with you. Jesus, you have purchased our salvation. You have purchased us out of the slave market of sin. We thank you for taking the cup of wrath, Lord, so that we wouldn't have to. So, Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for the blessing of this new covenant that we can be called sons and daughters of God, that our sins can be forgiven. We can have this new life in the Spirit of God who lives inside of us. So at this communion time today, we just say, Lord Jesus, I do. I do participate in this covenant with you. We say thank you, Jesus, for redemption and purchases, purchasing us out of that slave market of sin. We thank you for taking the cup of wrath, Lord Jesus. We praise you today. And Lord, we remember you in our time of communion this morning. Lord, we bless your holy name. Let's just continue to worship today. Light it up. 
There's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. That song goes perfect with my message today. Nothing is impossible with our God. We need to remember that. My sermon today is called Out of Options. I remember when I was probably around 13 years old, I had a very scary encounter. I was with my friend Daryl at the time, and we were walking to the arena. And as we were cutting across a parking lot, a car pulled up behind us, and three young adult men jumped out. And they were yelling something about some kids throwing rocks at their car. We were not those kids, but they thought otherwise. These dudes were bigger, faster, and stronger than we were. And as they closed in on us, I knew I couldn't run back or to the left or to the right. The only option that I had was to run forward down a steep bank covered with trees. And so... That's what I did. I took off running, my friend Daryl behind me. And so we got to the arena. I flung open the first door. I I ran down a hallway of of dressing rooms. And I got to the other side of the arena. I flung open another door. And I ran out that door and down the street. And I took side streets all the way home. At this point, I'm separated from my friend Daryl. I found a forest and I walked through the forest. And finally, I arrived back at home. And then my friend Daryl was there waiting for me. And I said, what happened to you? He said, I got caught. And so Daryl pled his innocence before these guys, and and they let him go. Uh, But they did ask him, listen, 
who was that friend who was with you? And he lied about my identity, and they were none the wiser. And uh, all they had to say afterwards was, wow, that boy is fast. Today, we are going to look at a portion of Scripture in Exodus 14. At this juncture, the Israelites are trapped as well. They are landlocked with the Red Sea ahead of them, mountains on either side of them, and an army of Egyptians is storming down behind them. It seemed they would be carried back into the slavery that they had just been delivered from. And so let's look at this, Exodus chapter 14. It says, Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses, Order the Israelites to turn back and camp at Bai Hahiroth, near Migdal, and the sea. Camp there along the shore, across from Baal Zephon. Then Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camp there, as they were told. It is obvious from the start that this is a complete setup. God told Moses and the Israelites exactly where to camp. He told Moses exactly what Pharaoh was thinking and that he was going to harden his heart. The result would be the hot pursuit of Pharaoh and his whole army. God orchestrated the whole thing to show everyone who was in charge. We don't always consider our desperate situation just might be a setup that is ordained by God himself to remind us who is in charge. What looks like certain doom could very well be the opportunity for God to show himself strong on our behalf. So before you panic, why not take a moment and ask God if this might not be just another opportunity for him to display his glory in your life. Drop down to verse 9. It says, The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers, and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Pi Hahiroth, across from Baal Zephon. This verse gives us the tale of the tape. It shows us the magnitude of this mismatch. Pharaoh went all in on this attack. A couple of times it mentioned that all his forces, horses, chariots, charioteers, and troops were involved in this mission to recapture and return the slaves. The Israelites had little, if any, weapons of their own. They were a mass of people, but they were helpless before such a vast army. They were outnumbered, they were outresourced, and they were out of options. The Egyptians thought that they had the Israelites right where they wanted them. But really, the opposite was true. God had the Egyptians right where he wanted them. Verse 9 says the Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel. Maybe some things have caught up with you as well. Perhaps some bad choices financially have caught up with you. Maybe neglecting your health has caught up with you. Possibly the consequences of this latest lockdown have caught up with you. And right now, it might seem like you are at the mercy of your circumstances. You may be out of options, but I want you to know that God is not out of options. So verse 10 tells us, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. The Israelites would soon find out that they were overtaken, but they were not forsaken. In faith today, many of you need to declare, I am overtaken, but I am not forsaken. Hebrews 13.5 declares, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The Israelites were out of options. An option is something that is chosen. It is an alternative, a, a different pathway to the same destination. We are an option-oriented society. We want and we need options. 
If we are looking for a car, we want to know our options, and there are many of them. And the same goes for buying a house or shoes or clothes. If we're going out to eat, we have options of burgers and chicken and pizza, Mexican, Chinese, Italian, fine dining, fast food, or something in between. We have a gazillion options nowadays. God used this opportunity when they were out of options, though, to display his glory. Now, the word opportunity, that means circumstances that are favorable for a purpose to be accomplished. An opportunity is a good chance to advance yourself. It is a moment to accomplish something. When we run out of human options, the door is open for a divine opportunity. When we run out of options, we are given the opportunity to seek God. See, Satan loves to bring us to the place where we are out of options. It is at these moments when we often concede, compromise, and quit. Instead, we need to realize that when we are out of options, it is an opportunity to experience God like we never have before. And so here is how Israel reacted when they realized that they were out of options. It says in verse 10, They cried out to the Lord, And they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. (laughs) Wasn't their faith staggering? Please note my sarcasm. Uh, Moses, however, saw this as an opportunity. Verse 13, But Moses told the people, Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Somewhere in our seemingly hopeless situations is an opportunity to see God's power revealed in our lives. When there is no other person that can help, place to run, or practical solution, we are forced to concede. It is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. These are opportunities for us to pray, to search out scripture, to praise in the midst of pain. When we don't have visible options, we always have divine opportunities. These are times when we are invited to come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. See, when we have too many options, we don't think we need divine opportunities. When we have options, we are in control. When we run out of options, God is in control. And this is the moment that we realize we have to have a miracle. This is illustrated for us in Mark chapter 2. Jesus is teaching in the home that it, and it's surrounded with people. Four men carried their paralyzed friend to see Jesus in hopes that he would heal them. Unfortunately, they couldn't get anywhere near Jesus. They were out of options. They weren't going to pass up an opportunity, though, to get to Jesus. So they crawled up to the top of the house with their friend, and they cut a hole in the roof, and they lowered him down in front of the healer. Their faith caught Jesus' attention. The result is recorded for us in Mark 2, verse 11. It says, Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Sometimes to take advantage of an opportunity, you risk looking foolish. And that is what these men did. And as a result, their friend was healed. That is what Moses did as well. Back to Exodus 14, verse 21 now, it says, Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. 
The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. <laughs> Look at that crazy Moses. We are in fear for our lives, and he's out there raising his staff over the water. He's finally gone off the deep end, the Israelites must have thought. Wait a minute. What's happening? The sea is parting. <laughs> Sorry, Moses. Sorry, God. They went through the other side. The Egyptians chased after them. And then Moses did that thing with his staff again, and the pursuing army met their doom in the Red Sea. Verse 31 tells us, when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. Isn't it amazing how quickly their attitudes changed? In order for the Israelites to move toward their promised future, they had to get through the Red Sea. Quite often, if we want an answer, we have to challenge our obstacle. We can't let the obvious overwhelm us. Sometimes we have to attack our problem and walk into it with faith. It may require risk, taking a chance or even looking foolish. It wasn't until all options were gone for the Israelites that they found their divine opportunity. When we start talking like there is no way out, and we don't know what to do, and we don't know how to fix it, and there's no escape, that must be when God looks down from heaven and says, I have you right where I want you. Do we really think our problems are too big for God to handle? He is the one who spoke the world into existence, raised the dead, caused the blind to see, fed the multitudes with a few fish and loaves of bread. Our God is still way maker, mountain mover, miracle working, Satan crushing, victor to whom nothing is impossible. Oh, I'm hoping you're shouting amen today at your TV, your computer screen. See, once we stop looking around, we will start looking up. We only tend to look up when looking around hasn't worked. But it is when we look up that we open the door to divine possibilities. Often we want to find a way to escape, but God wants us to experience. We want to get out, but God wants us to go through. When we reach the point where we run out of options, that is the most crucial time to turn to God. So many people are not living for God because they have too many options. This world will offer you a bunch of options. Jesus does not give us a multitude of options. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We are to follow Jesus wherever he might lead us. It might be to a glorious mountaintop, a deep, dark valley, or a long and arduous plain. Our job is to follow and trust and obey. If you have run out of options, it is not necessarily a bad thing. God might just have you right where he wants you. It might be a place of desperation, but you can make the greatest discovery of your life. You can find God right in the middle of your desperate circumstance. Jesus told the parable of a son who had left home. He spent his entire inheritance. He was reduced to feeding pigs and was slowly starving to death. It was when he was out of options that he turned his thoughts toward his father and his home. And the story ends with his return and this beautiful reconciliation. See, we can only become followers of Christ when we realize that there are no other options. There is no other way to find forgiveness of our sins. There is no other way to be reconciled to our Heavenly Father. There is no other option that will bring us eternal life. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Abraham Lincoln once said, 
I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Why does it take us so long to be driven to our knees in prayer? Why do we have to be out of options before we call upon the Lord for help? Thankfully, miracles happen when we are out of options and we take the opportunity to seek God's face. Second Chronicles 20 it records one of the most interesting battles that ever took place. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. Three enemy armies had joined forces to wipe out his people. Verse 12 records his plea to God. O oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. They were out of options. God intervened with a unique battle plan. They walked into battle praising God. As the invading armies approached, they were thrown into confusion over who their enemy was. They ended fighting up and killing each other. All that was left for Jehoshaphat and his people was to gather up the spoils. God wants us to be humble enough to pray. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. There may not be a single option the world can offer you at this moment, but the good news is you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Do not neglect the help that God has already made available to you by his spirit who is in you. The same can be said about Samson. He was a man of great strength that seemed invincible. His sinful choices led him down a path of destruction. He was imprisoned. His eyes were plucked out, his head shaved. He was bound in chains. He was absolutely humiliated. He was out of options when he called on God. Judges 16, 28 records his prayer. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. O oh Lord, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. And so God granted Samson's request. And Samson pushed on the pillars of their temple and it came crashing down, killing more Philistines in his death than when he lived. What we face when we run out of options is a divine opportunity. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about a woman in Scripture who came to Jesus. She had been sick for 12 years, been to every doctor she could, spent all of her money. She was out of options. And then she heard Jesus was coming by. This was her divine opportunity. And so she reached out in faith and she touched Jesus' cloak and she was instantly healed. Just another case of being out of options that led to a wonderful, wonderful miracle. So if you are out of options today, it might be a setup for a divine opportunity. You have no answers, but I am here to tell you today, no matter what you are going through, Jesus is the answer. That's more than a token Christian cliche. It is an eternal truth. Declare your dependence on God. Confront your obstacle and keep your eyes open for what God will do. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. So why don't we sing that song in faith right now? It's just called Waymaker. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way.
Pray with me today. Lord Jesus, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, we come to you today. Lord, for those that are listening and they would say, I am out of options, Lord Jesus. I have nowhere else to go. Lord, that's actually a good thing. It's now we can come to you. We can come to you believing for this divine opportunity. Lord, is an opportunity today for someone to say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior. I come to you for forgiveness of my sins. I come to you for a new life. Lord, I thank you for all those that are taking this opportunity to find new life in you, eternal life that only you can bring. You are the only option. Lord, for those that are seen back into a corner today, they don't know what else to do. Lord, I pray that a faith would rise in their hearts and souls today and just cry out to you. Say, Lord, I'm out of options, but I know you're not. And you have me right where you want me. And Lord, you're going to come through 
and do great things in my life. So Lord, we're going to walk in to the obstacle. Lord, we're going to risk maybe even looking foolish to show that you are a strong and wise, all-knowing God that nothing is impossible for. So Lord, just begin to make a way right now. Work your miracles. Keep your promises. Lord, encourage your saints today. I thank you for every person that has listened to this message, that has worshipped with us. Lord, just let your spirit rise within them today. Lord, let faith just bubble up in their souls. Let them be inspired to face this week. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us today. And just let your faith be strong this week and believe for mighty things. Ask that you would like our videos and subscribe. And if you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to evangelpenta at bellnet.ca. I would love to hear from you. So until we're able to meet together again or you're just watching us by video, Lord bless you and keep you in the palm of his hand. And we will see you soon.